was a peaceful summer night back in 1963. So peaceful that no one ever thought that an audacious plan was now taking place. In just a short amount of time, this band of men managed to nab a staggering 2.6 million pounds, equivalent to 33 million pounds today. In this high-stakes game of cat and mouse, these bold men thought they had the bank in their bags, but fate had its board to play. The game they played turned against them in the most ironic way possible. This is a story of big risks, bigger loot, and the biggest twist that flips the game on its head. This is the story of one of the most infamous robberies in British history, the Great Train Robbery of 1963. During the 60s, Britain was experiencing rapid economic growth and living standards were gradually changing. This was marked by increased spending among consumers and a more vibrant middle class. Significant modernization was happening and a remarkable advance in technology, as well as cultural revolutions in music, fashion, and social norms marked the swinging 60s. This also led the way to a consumer culture boom and people were spending more money on cars, clothes, and all the nice things that were being sold back then. During this time, London then emerged as a cultural and financial center, attracting a diverse population, not just within Europe, but all over the world. But the good things came with the bad. And while there is an economic boom, financial challenges are still occurring. Experts say that this might have contributed to the emergence of organized crime and the rise of notable criminal figures like the Cray Twins and their gang called The Firm. In the 1960s, the railway system was very important in the business of transporting goods and even money. During those times, commerce and banking often required the transportation of large sums of money across the country. With this, law enforcement was pressured to do more, which led them to necessitate more sophisticated crime-fighting methods. However, because of the lack of technology and inadequate security, these operations became a favorite target of heists. This might be the reason why the infamous 15 men decided to target a Royal Mail train. And from that, the rest was history. The heist came to existence all because of the masterminding of one Bruce Reynolds, a charismatic and ambitious criminal. He was already a notable figure in the criminal underworld at the time. After being a part of a string of robberies, including a security van robbery at Heathrow Airport, that netted 62,000 pounds. Bruce, nicknamed Napoleon, wanted more. So he envisioned a heist that could set him up for life. He wanted a life-changing score. So he decided he needed to assemble a team of individuals who had unique skills and criminal pedigree. In comes Ronald Arthur Biggs, commonly known as Ronnie. He was picked for his logistical knowledge and played a big role in managing the more intricate details of the plan. Another Ronald was added named Ronald Edwards, more known as Buster. He was a former boxer and nightclub owner and served as the muscle for the high stakes operation. Add in the financial wizard and treasurer Charlie Wilson to the mix and criminal strategist Gordon Goody and the core team is completed. The team then expanded, involving Roy James, a man with a penchant for speed and evasion, appropriately assigned as the getaway driver. They also needed more connections so the skills of Jimmy White were included since he had a network of underworld contacts and provided the necessary connections and criminal knowledge. John Daly was also associated with the gang and was known for his ties to the criminal underworld and for handling various logistical aspects of the robbery. Adding into the bunch are a few more muscles by the names of Tommy Wisby and Bob Welch, who are known for their intimidating physical presence as well as Jimmy Hussey, who was tasked to manage heavy lifting. Brian Field was also included, acting as the legal fixer, and was tasked to manage the arrangements in buying the farm hideout the group used after the robbery. Engineer Bill Bowl and solicitor John Weeder were also involved according to People, but their roles seemed to be more on the post-heist circumstances. And since they are robbing a train, they need to stop the train first. That is why Roger Cordray brought his railway expertise to the team, completing the 15-strong gang of men. However, the target is not just any train. It was the Royal Mail train, which meant that they needed intel from the inside 
to make sure that the plan would be successful. In comes the man they called the Ulster Man, who acted as an insider with all the necessary and critical information on the royal train, its route, schedule, and the amount of cash it carried. This man's knowledge and connection only made the heist even more ambitious, but feasible. The 15 men meticulously planned the robbery, going to secretive places like Twickenham and Wimbledon Common to avoid police. These meetings helped them strategize the heist down to the last tiny detail, which involved stopping the train at the railway bridge. As they closed into the decided date of the heist, the team held recon missions to the site to get a better understanding and experience of the place and check possible logistical challenges. They managed to secure the Leather Slade Farm as their base and hideout, and acquired two Land Rovers as their getaway vehicles. The team had their last meeting on the night preceding the heist. The roles are now assigned to the players, and the game of chase is about to begin. The group of thieves is now all set to execute one of the most audacious heists ever and would put their names into the annals of criminal history. On the night of the heist, Bruce Reynolds and the gang are waiting at Leatherslade Farm, waiting for the go signal to commence. A last minute call delayed the heist, but it was for the promise of a larger haul. This delay, however, put a mix of frustration and anticipation in the men. This also triggered doubts among the members who worried about their success. But Bruce, being a steadfast ringleader, reassures the crew that everything will fall into place. But after a bit more waiting, the moment finally arrives. Bruce then dons his SAS beret, and the team, armed with cautious and other non-lethal weapons, executes the first phase of the heist, signal tampering at Cheddington. This helped them stop the train at their command. They cut telephone wires as well to isolate the area and prevent outside communication. When the train finally stopped, the gang started moving to execute the plan. They pushed forward with the heist, but encountered a slight hiccup when the train driver, Jack Mills, confronted them. They had to fight, of course, leaving the driver seriously injured but alive. Fortunately, the team used non-lethal weapons. It was smart thinking for the robbers, because not using firearms meant they would minimize the risk of a murder charge which would give them more problems just in case they got caught. Despite the roadblock, the team managed to continue and efficiently move the money to their vehicles. Time is important at this moment, and they cannot stay longer at the risk of getting caught, so they have to leave a few bags in haste to escape. After the heist, they went back to their hideout, feeling relieved, but also feeling excited after executing the plan and managing to steal a load of money. The robbery was done fast, and in the silent onslaught of everything, the train's remaining crew began to piece together what happened. Everyone in Britain is in for the shock of their lives in the morning, as the great train robbery has been executed right under their noses. The monumental heist Bruce Reynolds and his team committed triggered an extensive police investigation, and all news outlets in Fleet Street are talking about them and the robbery. The police, in their relentless pursuit, then zeroed in on the robber's hideout. Leather Slade Farm. The place was hastily abandoned, with the remnants of the robber's things still left there. The police thought that the investigation would take a more difficult turn and the gang would get away with robbery. But everything changed when they found evidence that would turn the cat and mouse chase on its head. A seemingly innocent Monopoly game board. It was dismissed at first, but it soon told a story to be known for decades to come. Little did the police know that the board game was a treasure trove of fingerprints. The mere game became an important piece of evidence. It is quite the irony, to be honest. Here is a group of criminals who planned a meticulous heist, unknowingly and carelessly, leaving their fingerprints on a children's game, all because they played with it using the very money they had stolen. The very game that witnessed their success became their downfall. The story of one of the greatest heists of all time became one of the greatest lessons in criminal history. The smallest slip-up can bring about the greatest collapse. Also, do not play Monopoly with the money you stole. The Monopoly money comes with the board game, so stick with that.
After the heist, the men navigated their fates. But still, speculation swirled around the Ulsterman. Douglas Goody said in a 2014 interview, They just stole a fucking train. And Charlie put the windows in. The people decided we'd be frightened. I opened up one bag, and I'll tell you something, you see them bags, there are 120 bags there. It was a sight to see. We cracked it. Yeah, that is it. We cracked it. However, with the gang's members now gone, the truth behind the Ulster man's identity is likely to remain an unresolved chapter in the saga. The legal and personal repercussions for the gang members spanned dramatic escapes, quiet lives, post-incarceration, and, for some, violent ends. Their exact role in the heist, crucial yet veiled, adds a layer of enduring mystery to the story of the great train robbery, a crime that remains as captivating in its complexity as in its audacious execution. The great train robbery of 1963 has been immortalized in pop culture through songs, films, and books, even inspiring a 2013 TV series. Some people may wonder why such a crime seemed to pique the attention of many, but its allure does not only rely on its scale, but on the human stories behind it. After all, stories about anti-heroes captivate people in the same way that movies and other forms of media that discuss such characters engage audiences. This bold crime, despite happening over half a century ago, still reflects societal fascination with the perfect crime, even in the present times. Its legacy, intrigue, and defiance continue to challenge and influence the world of security, legal practices, and the cultural narrative, making it a subject of fascination. Have a unique take on the great train robbery. Drop your theory in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out our channel's other exciting videos.